God did not allow these creatures to enter Noah's Ark. Fish and Marine Creatures In Genesis chapter 6, verse 7, it is mentioned that when God revealed his plan to destroy the world with a flood, he told Noah that he would eliminate man, whom he had created from the face of the earth, along with animals, creeping things, and birds of the sky, for he regretted having made them. Interestingly, fish and other marine creatures were not included in this plan of destruction. Some passages in the Genesis flood section may help clarify whether the fish were affected by the flood or not. In Genesis 6 verse 17, it is mentioned that, Behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, specifically, everything on land shall die. The flood waters would drown them. Logically, aquatic animals would not be affected by more water. It is also hard to see how fish could be described as having breath, as terrestrial animals and birds were selected to board the ark, but fish and marine creatures were not. In Genesis 6, verses 19 to 21, it is mentioned that of every living thing found on land, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of birds and fowl according to their kind, of animals according to their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. Also take with you every kind of food that is eatable, and you shall gather and store it, and it will be food for you and for them. This seems to indicate that marine creatures did not need the ark to survive. Genesis 7 verses 20 to 23 lists the animals that died, but marine life is not included. Indeed, the waters rose 15 cubits above the highest ground, and the mountains were covered. All living beings that moved on the land perished. Birds and livestock, domestic animals, wild animals, all creeping things that crawl on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land in whose nostrils was the breath and spirit of life died. God destroyed, wiped out, eliminated every living being that was on the surface of the earth. Man and animals and creeping things and birds of the sky were wiped out from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. In Genesis 8 verse 1, it is mentioned that after the flood, God remembered Noah and all the beasts and animals that were with him in the ark. However, it is unclear why God did not remember the fish and marine creatures. These creatures were not destroyed like the other animals, so it is uncertain why they were not specifically mentioned. The Hebrew worldview had an interesting way of categorizing animal life. According to Genesis chapter 1 verse 21, the fifth day of creation included the creation of fish and marine life, as well as flying creatures and birds. It says thus, God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Terrestrial animals, on the other hand, were created on the sixth day, as mentioned in Genesis 1 verse 24. According to these verses, the Jewish people divided animal life into three categories, marine life, flying animals, and terrestrial animals. However, only flying and terrestrial animals were taken aboard the ark, as fish and other forms of marine life were not at risk underwater. Secondly, regarding most unclean animals, Noah took two of every kind of animal onto the ark, right? Actually, not exactly. The Bible states in Genesis 7 verses 2 to 3 that of every clean animal you must take with you seven pairs, the male and its female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, the male and its female. Also of the birds of the sky, seven pairs, the male and the female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of the earth. According to Genesis chapter 6 verse 19, Noah was instructed to bring more clean animals than unclean onto the ark. However, there is some ambiguity in the Hebrew phrase translated as seven pairs, which literally means seven sevens. It is unclear whether Noah brought seven specimens of each clean species, three pairs and an extra, or seven pairs. Nonetheless, only the clean animals entered in pairs. 
In Leviticus 11, a distinction is made between clean and unclean animals, but this law was given after Noah's time. Despite this, we know that Noah was aware of which animals were clean and unclean. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 4, it is mentioned that sacrifices were made to God before the Mosaic law was given. This suggests that God had communicated to man which animals were suitable for sacrifice and later for consumption. However, we are not told exactly how Noah knew the difference. Leviticus 11 specifies which animals are clean and unclean. Here are some examples. Clean animals are those that have a cloven hoof and chew the cud, such as sheep, goats, deer and cattle. Clean seafood must have both scales and fins like cod, grouper and sunfish. Certain birds, such as doves, chickens and ducks, are also considered clean. Interestingly, some insects like locusts and grasshoppers are also deemed clean. Unclean animals include terrestrial animals that either do not chew the cud or do not have a cloven hoof, such as pigs, dogs, cats, horses, donkeys and rats. Seafood lacking fins or scales, like mollusks, lobsters, oysters and catfish, are also considered unclean. Some birds, such as owls, hawks and vultures, are considered unclean, as well as other creatures like reptiles and amphibians. The New Testament teaches that we are no longer judged based on the foods we eat, Colossians 2, verse 16. However, nutritionists have observed that the Old Testament's categorization of clean and unclean foods actually provides practical guidance for a healthy diet in a time before modern food safety practices. Eating only clean animals would have helped people avoid many health problems. God's distinction between clean and unclean animals was not just about diet, but also to remind Israel of their separate status to worship the one true God. In the book of Genesis chapter 7, the reference to clean animals would have been understood by the original audience as meaning animals that God had designated as fit for consumption and sacrifice. It would have made sense for Noah to include more clean animals than unclean on the ark, as they were not just for preservation, but also for future use. After the flood, Noah made a sacrifice as mentioned in Genesis 8 verse 20, since he had taken seven or seven pairs of each clean animal on the ark, there would still be many animals remaining to repopulate the earth after the sacrifice. Noah received a command to take seven pairs of clean animals, where a pair represents a male and a female. Additionally, God performed a miracle by leading the animals to orderly gather and enter the ark in pairs, as stated in verse 9. Nephilim, the true story of the Nephilim. Scripture indicates that a portion of Satan's fallen angels failed to maintain their proper domain by materializing and interacting with humans in ways angels were never intended to do. This interaction is depicted in Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4. In Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4, it is said that when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and took wives for themselves of all that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is also flesh, yet his days shall be one hundred twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. At first glance, there are no signs of angelic or demonic involvement, however. A passage in Job provides more insights into the omnipotence of God, detailing his control over creation. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements, if you know? Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, Job 38 verses 4 to 7. The morning stars are often interpreted as angels. It is known that God founded the earth before humanity was created. Therefore, the mention of the sons of God in Genesis 6 is believed to refer to angels as well. 
This implies that the sons of God in Genesis 6 are also angels. The Nephilim, also known as the Fallen, are mysterious figures mentioned in Genesis 6 verse 4 as the mighty men who were of old men of renown. However, the text does not provide any explanation of how the Nephilim came into existence. It simply states that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Why are the Nephilim mentioned in Genesis 6 alongside the intermarriage of the sons of God and the daughters of men? It is unclear how these men of renown arose, if not as a result of the intermarriage between spiritual beings and humans. Jude probably understands Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4 as referring to the intermarriage between spiritual beings and humans. Jude 6 speaks about angels who disobeyed and left their designated authority position. According to the Bible, this event occurred when the angels left heaven to dwell on earth, as described in Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4. These arguments support the traditional view that the sons of God united with human women and gave birth to the Nephilim, although this may seem strange to modern ears. The same could be said for the entire Bible. Truth is stranger than fiction, and the world God created is far from what we commonly believe. It is said that certain beings were overcome with desire upon seeing the daughters of men. These beings, known as the sons of God or angels, proceeded to unite with these women, resulting in offspring who were half angelic and half human. These offspring were called the Nephilim. The Bible does not provide a clear reason why the angels engaged in this behavior, but it can be inferred that these sons of God were evil and twisted beings, and as such, their actions should not surprise. In terms of specific motivation, one theory holds that these beings were attempting to corrupt the human lineage to prevent the Messiah from appearing. God had promised that the Messiah would crush the head of the serpent, Satan, one day. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, therefore I hid myself. God said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We can deduce why Satan sent his angel to mingle with human women, Directly or indirectly, Satan tried to pollute the human genetic pool with satanic corruption, planting something that resembles a genetic pathogen in order to make humans unfit to carry the seed of the woman, the promised Messiah in Genesis 3 verse 15. The Savior could not be born of a demon-possessed mother, so if Satan could successfully infect the entire race, the Deliverer could not come, and Satan nearly succeeded. Humanity had become so corrupted that God decided to start over with Noah and his sons and imprison the demons that had caused the corruption so they could never do it again. God's response to this great wickedness was, My spirit shall not contend with man forever, meaning God did not intend for the human race to remain in this rebellious state indefinitely. This suggests that our rejection of God reached a point of no return. God will not court us indefinitely. There will come a time when he will say no more, making it all the more crucial for us to declare that today, rather than tomorrow, is the day we respond to Jesus. We have no promise that God will draw us in any other way. Yet his days shall be 120 years is interesting because the flood also occurred 120 years after this declaration. 
marking God's immediate response with a flood to destroy all the earth and all traces of these unholy unions. It is believed that the Nephilim were one of the main reasons for the great flood that occurred in Noah's time. After the introduction of the Nephilim, the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. Every thought and inclination of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted having made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart to see how they were behaving. In Genesis 6 verses 4 to 8, it says there were Nephilim, men of stature, notorious men on earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God cohabited with the daughters of men and had children with them. These were the mighty men, who were of old, men of great reputation and fame. The Lord saw that the wickedness and depravity of man was great on the earth, and that every imagination or intent of the thoughts of his heart was continually only evil. The Lord regretted that he had made humanity on the earth and was deeply grieved in his heart. Thus, the Lord said, I will destroy, annihilate humanity I have created from the surface of the earth, not just man, but also the animals, the creeping things, and the birds of the sky, because it deeply saddens me to see humanity sinning and I regret having made them. But Noah found favor and grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the story of Noah's ark, God was displeased with the state of the world and decided to flood the entire earth resulting in the destruction of almost everything except Noah, his family, and the animals on the ark. Even the Nephilim were not spared. According to Genesis 6 verse 6, the Lord was repentant. Some translations use the word saddened instead of repentant. In Hebrew, the word for feeling sadness or repentance is nakam, which means to deeply lament or sigh heavily. To say that the Lord repented is a way of God using human language to help us understand His heart. The verse implies that human sin broke God's heart. God is complete love. He loves us and does not want anything to go wrong with us. It breaks His heart when we sin and He is shaken by our sins. But why did men suddenly become so violent? Was it because the divine lineage mixed with the wicked lineage, or was it at least partly because humanity mingled with spiritual beings? I would argue in favor of the latter hypothesis. Were there Nephilim after the flood? It seems that the fallen angels committed their sin again after the flood, though likely to a lesser extent than before the flood. The Israelites returned to Moses with the following information after exploring the land of Canaan. Numbers 13 verse 33 says, And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, who come from the giants, and we were in our own eyes as grasshoppers, and so we were in their eyes. It's also possible that after the flood, demons mingled again with human women, resulting in more Nephilim. It's even possible that some traits of the Nephilim were transmitted through the lineage of one of Noah's daughters-in-law. Either way, the Israelites destroyed these giants during their invasion of Canaan in the Old Testament. The word giant is most commonly referred to by the word refame throughout the Old Testament narrative. The refame serve as a fascinating and significant recurring motif. In the days of Lot, Jesus likens the end times to the days of Noah in Luke 17 verses 26 to 30. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day that Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from the sky and destroyed them all. It will be exactly the same on the day the Son of Man is revealed. There is a final aspect of the last days that Jesus points out, which was present in the societies of Noah and Lot. Jesus talks about these activities. Jesus mentions eight specific activities, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, buying, selling, building, and planting. There is nothing intrinsically sinful about these activities. So what was the problem? The problem was that they were so immersed in these activities that they did not recognize the days they were living in. 
I would sum up this problem in one word, materialism. They were so immersed in the material that they had no understanding or alertness to the spiritual and eternal. The final trait of the days of Noah and Lot then was materialism. How much materialism exists in the world today? I would say that Western civilization is practically flooded with it, and this is by no means excluded from Christians. There are many professed Christians who are as materialistic in their hearts as the unbelievers. Perhaps they are a bit less demonstrative about it, perhaps it is not so apparent in their lifestyles, but they are absorbed by materialism. Jesus warned us that if we fall into the pit of materialism, we will not be ready when he comes. We will be in the same category as the people of the days of Noah and Lot. The parallel narrative in Luke 17 verse 26 gives this wording, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. To understand the days prior to the return of Jesus, therefore, we need to find out what the days of Noah were like. For an account of those days, we will examine the book of Genesis for the essential elements. On the positive side, alert for survival, we have discussed the evil elements that were prevalent during the times of Noah and Lot. As we saw, various forms of evil were widespread. However, it would be unfair to paint a complete picture of these times without also highlighting the positive side, for there was a positive side to these times in two main aspects. There is good news about the days of Noah as Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 states, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was righteous, a perfect man in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Among all these people, there was one man who had an intimate and personal relationship with God. God could speak to him and tell him how he saw the situation and the judgment he was about to bring. For us, as believers, Noah sets a standard we should follow. Noah and his family were the only survivors of that tragedy. It seems clear to me that only those who live like Noah and his family will survive today. Hebrews chapter 11 has just one verse about Noah. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the salvation of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is by faith. Number four, the wicked generation. Jesus meets the imprisoned souls of the flood. This is what happened in the spiritual realm when Jesus died. Jesus faced the great challenge of sacrificing his life for the good of the whole world. Despite the overwhelming and terrible nature of this mission, he accepted it after hanging on the cross for three hours. Jesus gave up his life, however, he was not helpless, for only he had the authority to end his own life. What happened in the spiritual realm after this event? Peter provides the answer to this question. Peter was one of the first two people that Jesus called to follow him. Initially, he was easily influenced, like a reed blown by the wind. However, after Jesus left him, he became firm as a rock. Peter was first on each list of the twelve, and he was the unofficial spokesperson for the group. Do you know where his spirit went? What happened to him? Did he end up in heaven or hell? There is some dispute about the whereabouts of Jesus, or more specifically, the location of his spirit in the three days between his death and resurrection. Where was Jesus? Another passage is often mentioned in the discussion about where Jesus was in the three days between his death and resurrection, namely 1 Peter 3, 18-21. These verses constitute one of the most enigmatic and intriguing texts of the New Testament. Jesus is the epitome of what it means to suffer for the sake of doing good, to bring us to God and restore our broken and dead relationship with Him. He who has just endured suffering for all of us who are unjust. The purpose of all this was to bring us to God. 1 Peter 3 18 to 21 states that Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient, when the patience of God waited in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. 
Corresponding to this, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We read whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison who had previously been disobedient. Jesus preached to the spirits in prison with the help of the Holy Spirit. It seems this was done after Jesus died, but before he resurrected. Did Jesus really preach to the spirits in Hades? Yes, that's right. Hades is considered the realm of the dead, and Jesus supposedly went there to deliver his message. It is quite fascinating to think about this. Jesus preached to the spirits in prison. Have you ever wondered who holds the highest level of authority and power in this world? The Bible provides a clear answer to this question, regardless of your personal beliefs, stating that even those who are buried deep below the earth must recognize Jesus as their supreme Lord. This statement reminds us of the extraordinary power and authority that Jesus holds over everything in the universe. While this concept may be humbling, it also provides us hope and comfort, knowing that we have a kind and powerful Lord who is in control of everything. Philippians 2 verse 10 states that, At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. We read about those who are under the earth, and this text makes it very clear that Jesus was involved in conversations with others and that he maintained his consciousness during the period of time he spent between his death and his resurrection. The others with whom he communicated were equally fully conscious and actively involved in conversations with him immediately following his death. He traveled to the realm of the dead and preached there on the first Easter Sunday. I can imagine Peter meeting Jesus face to face and asking him, where on earth have you been? I can imagine this happening, to which he replied that he wasn't really on earth, but rather in Hades which is the realm of the dead. What on earth or what is Hades were you doing there? And why were you there? Jesus tells Peter that he was preaching to those who drowned in Noah's flood. The spirit and body are separated by death. Jesus went through all three stages in a period of time that was less than a week. He became an incarnate spirit, died on the cross and committed his spirit to God. And finally, his body was laid in the tomb. He continued to live in his spiritual form and carried out his mission of preaching on Easter Sunday morning. His body and spirit were reunited and he remained fully conscious and capable of communication throughout these stages. The identity of the spirits here, the spirits in prison are clearly identified. Who were they? Those who were disobedient. When were they disobedient? These spirits from the wicked generation in the early chapters of Genesis, specifically in chapter 6 verses 1 to 5 of the Bible, paint a picture of the world before the flood. The earth was not a place of peace or kindness, but was filled with sin, violence and moral corruption. Imagine a world where people are consumed by their desires, always seeking to do what they want, regardless of the cost to others. Honesty, integrity and kindness are not celebrated or even understood as virtues. Instead, deception and manipulation dominate the day. Everyone is concerned only with themselves, and the very fabric of society is torn apart by selfishness and evil. In this environment, families are not sanctuaries of love and support, but battlefields of deceit and betrayal. Neighbors do not care for each other. They seek to exploit one another. Governments are not institutions of justice, but rather systems of oppression, maintaining the rule of the powerful over the weak. From the beginning, we see that Noah is going to be special, as he is the only member of this genealogy whose name is explained. His father, Lamech, states that his son, Noah, will bring relief. Noah sounds like the Hebrew word for rest or relief. We quickly learn what Noah was supposed to relieve in Genesis 6 verses 1 to 8, where we see the rampant results of the fall, as injustice increases across the world. Genesis 6 verse 22 says that Noah did these things according to all that God had commanded him, so he did them. It is unknown how many people were on earth at the time of the flood, according to the Bible, so we can only make educated guesses about the pre-flood population. 
According to some individuals, the human population was not very high in the past. The Bible indicates that before the flood, people were extremely immoral and aggressive. It is plausible to consider that there were numerous wars, diseases, and other circumstances that could have limited population growth. Divine Lord, in this moment of stillness, we come before you with open hearts and eager minds to receive your wisdom. We gather as seekers desiring to understand your word, the sacred text that lights our paths and nourishes our souls. Grant us the grace to approach the Bible with humility, recognizing that its depths are vast and its teachings profound. Help us to set aside our preconceptions and prejudices so that we may receive your message with clarity and receptivity. As we delve into the pages of the scriptures, guide us, Lord, in our quest for understanding. Illuminate the words on the page, bringing to life ancient stories and timeless truths. May your Holy Spirit be our ever-present companion, revealing the deeper meanings hidden in the text. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you found this content valuable, I ask you to support me with your subscription so that you do not miss any of our upcoming videos. Together, we can enlighten more minds and expand our understanding. Thank you for being here, and may God bless you.